The United Kingdom is a country steeped in rich history. From the arrival of the Romans to the Industrial Revolution, from the establishment of the British Empire to the bloody battles of World War I and World War II, many of us are familiar with this country's past. But surprisingly, few of us can hold a conversation about what was going on before recorded human history began. How many of us can speak of the expansive Carboniferous swamps, or the great beasts that roamed Britain throughout the Cretaceous? The United Kingdom's millions of years of prehistory hold more secrets than we could ever imagine. With the science of paleontology, we're able to piece together a series of snapshots based on the various points in prehistoric time with the help of the fascinating and often bizarre fossils we have discovered at this country's bountiful dig sites. From these snapshots, we can determine just who was present on the scene of these points in prehistoric time. The land that would one day come to be known as the United Kingdom has played host to a plethora of weird and wonderful life forms in its lifetime. In this documentary, we will explore several of them in detail. Period by period, epoch by epoch, we will take a look at the great beasts that have called this land home in all their magnificent glory. We begin our journey 541 million years ago, in the Cambrian period of the Paleozoic era, long before the time of the dinosaurs. Here, the relatively small area of dry land present on the planet is an uninhabitable hellscape. Life can only exist underwater. No plants can grow and heavy erosion on the surface forces landslides into the water, preserving many different species remains in the sediment. Many of us may well be familiar with one of the creatures that thrived in these waters, the trilobites. Some of the world's earliest known arthropods. These crustacean-like creatures were common in these seas and spent the majority of their time on the sea floor, where they sifted through the sediment for food. Many different species can be found across the United Kingdoms throughout the Cambrian and subsequent ore division periods from the coastal species Nesuridus to the deep ocean dweller Witardolithus. These creatures were typically only a few centimeters long, but some larger individuals grew up to 60 centimeters. Aside from the trilobites, throughout both the Cambrian and or division periods, the most common animal scientists have unearthed are the Graptolites, basic colonial animals that lived in connected tube systems and the brachiopods, small shelled animals which still exist today. As unobtrusive as these creatures might seem, it was these humble beginnings that laid down the foundation for the vibrant menageries that the earth would see in the ages that followed. Following on the Ore Division period, we enter the Silurian, this period which ran from 443 to 416 million years ago saw the rise of the first small, basic land plants which began to oxygenate the terrestrial world. Animal life was still primarily aquatic, but the first arthropods had now begun to slowly creep out of the water and on to the largely featureless, inhospitable land above. One such arthropod to call the Silurian United Kingdom its home was the Brontoscorpio, a three-foot-long monster of a scorpion, which preyed upon the diversifying species of fish that would call these waters home. The species is known for a single pincer, from which we can deduce that it most likely bore an appearance similar to many of today's modern scorpions, only vastly oversized. In terms of the region's arthropods, however, Brontoscorpio was a small fry, larger than a fully grown adult man, Terry Gotis was a colossal aquatic Eurypterid, similar in form to modern scorpions, 
but with a much broader body and a flat, paddle-like tail. These giants may well have been ambush predators, living a lifestyle similar to a gigantic marine invertebrate crocodile. The Silurian didn't just harbor monsters, however. More delicate organisms drifted along the currents, such as the otherworldly Anictozoan, an ancient relative of crustaceans native to Silurian Scotland that better resembles a Hollywood alien spaceship than an Earth life form. The Devonian period followed, which was characterized by an explosion in the number of fishes present on planet Earth. More complex vertebrates were beginning to evolve, and the first tetrapods were about to make their first steps onto land, hauling themselves up from the oceans, lakes, and swamps familiar to them for millions of years prior. The United Kingdom provides us with some excellent examples of early fish from the Devonian period. Teraspis was a bizarre creature, with an armored body and a long, conical snout, unlike anything else alive today. While perhaps more familiar body plans can be found in creatures such as Osteolepus and Cacosteus, these fish most likely inhabited shallow oceans, surrounded by waterways where complex plants and trees were beginning to flourish. The Carboniferous period, which followed the Devonian, lasting from 359 to 299 million years ago, is perhaps the first truly iconic moment in British prehistory. The United Kingdom at this time was covered with vast, moist swampland, draped in fern forests that stretched far across the land. The tetrapod vertebrates had by this point diversified into many bizarre terrestrial and aquatic creatures, filling many niches that were vacant for life to evolve to occupy. The first reptiles and reptile-like creatures were well on their way by the Carboniferous. Little lizard-like animals, such as the West Lothiana, crawled through the undergrowth of the Carboniferous Scotland, most likely catching small insects. In the surrounding swamps, larger tetrapods, such as Philidogaster, may have hunted slightly larger game in the form of numerous early fish that stalked the forest wetlands at the time. Perhaps the most spectacular British creature of the Carboniferous is the amazing Crassigyrhinus, a two-meter-long predatory stem tetrapod, with useless stubby arms and a long, powerful paddle-like tail, and a large, broad mouth for snaring prey. These features point to an animal that must have spent its entire life in the murky swamps of Scotland, perhaps ambushing the local prey animals by springing out of the mud clouds of the dark water it haunted. The Carboniferous's iconic status comes not from its tetrapod stock, however, but from its invertebrate fossils. You may be familiar with some of the arthropod inhabitants of Carboniferous Britain, in fact. Perhaps the most famous is the Meganeura, the giant dragonfly the size of a large bird of prey, soaring low above the stagnant pools of the fern forests. This aerial predator may have caught food on the wing, terrorizing the inhabitants of the forest floor in swarms. Another Carboniferous inhabitant of prehistoric Scotland you wouldn't like to find amongst the invertebrates in your backyard is Arthropleura, a gigantic armored millipede just shy of three meters in length. To finish off this entomologist's dream of a world, the forest floor was stalked by the likely venomous Pulmonoscorpius, a scorpion the length of your forearm. These invertebrates were able to grow to the sheer sizes they did, due to the excess moisture and oxygen content in the air, as we have a much lower oxygen content in the modern atmosphere. We're a lot more used to the more modern-sized arthropods that now inhabit the British Isles, and that's surely a big relief for most people. To round off the Paleozoic era, we must make one final stop. From 298 million years to 251 million years ago, the world was plunged into the Permian period, characterized by its sole supercontinent Pangaea. 
Reptiles and synapsids, or proto-mammals, dominated the world. But large amphibians were still present across much of the globe. Britain at the time was a hot, dry landscape, overlain with rocky deserts and sand dunes. While the Permian is famous for its large megafaunal predators and herbivores, the fossils that scientists have unearthed in the United Kingdoms are much more modest, but nonetheless bizarre. Towards the end of the Permian, reptiles such as Elginia thrived on the sands and between the desert rocks that rose up above the dunes. Elginia perhaps resembled the thorny devil lizard of modern Australia, only it grew to around two feet long. We know this creature based on a single specimen of a skull in Scotland, a skull lined with rows of sharp horns and defensive spines indicating to predators that Elginia most likely wasn't a palatable or safe meal. Elsewhere in the British Isles, down in what would one day become southern England, the reptiles were diversifying into even weirder forms. Coelorosaurus, for example, was a foot-long reptile resembling today's modern gliding lizards, with two long wings that sprouted from either side of the creature's torso flanks. These structures were made up of hollow bones with folds of skin or patagium covering them to aid in allowing the reptile to glide between the sparse trees of what would have potentially been an arid scrubland environment. The Paleozoic era was brought to a catastrophic close at the end of the Permian with a mass extinction event known as the Great Dying. A series of cataclysmic volcanic eruptions resulted in a loss of 96% of all marine species as well as 70% of all terrestrial species. What followed was what most of us know as prehistory, the almighty Mesozoic era, the age of the dinosaurs. Our journey through the Mesozoic sees us arrive in the Triassic period a world dominated by bizarre reptiles, hardy synapsids, and most famous of all, the arrival of the first dinosaur on the scene around 250 million years ago. The Triassic is famous for producing a myriad of extravagant reptiles, unlike anything alive today. As the dominant class of animals on land, reptiles were free to diversify to fill the vacant evolutionary niches left behind by the great dying. Reptiles had begun to conquer land, sky, and sea, evolving into a plethora of different groups, orders, and families. The Aetosaurs were one such order. A bizarre example from the late Triassic of Scotland is the Staganolepus, a three-meter long armored herbivore, reminiscent of a giant reptilian cow or pig. These oversized quadrupeds featured a strange beak-like appendage on its upper jaw that projected upwards, allowing the creature to uproot the cycads and ferns that made up its diet. The late Triassic also saw the advent of the most successful group of animals the world has seen to date, the crocodilomorphs, the group that comprised modern crocodiles and alligators. Early crocodiles filled the British Triassic rivers, swamps, and forests, but the average Brit would hardly recognize them today. The tiny, slender Terrestrisuchus was one such crocodilian, discovered in Wales in 1952. This agile little hunter, which may have reached up to a meter in length as it ran nimbly on its long legs, helped lay the foundations for what would become some of the modern day's most feared predators. The Rhynchosaurs, on the other hand, seemed to be the Triassic's attempt to produce reptilian rodents. Hyperodabritin is an example from Triassic Scotland, known for its long forward-facing beak and teeth to chop up plant matter like a modern-day guinea pig or chinchilla. The Triassic was also famous for harboring the very first plesiosaurs, creatures such as Thalassiodracon, which would have hunted fish in the coastal waters of Triassic England were some of the first of the iconic long-necked marine reptiles we know as fossils today. 
the Lassio Draken was an indicator that these future giants were starting small. A humble two meters in length, but they still would have proven themselves as powerful, speedy hunters to the early fish that stalked the Triassic Seas of Britain 200 million years ago. The Triassic is, without a doubt, most famous for witnessing the evolution of the most infamous beasts the world has ever seen, the dinosaurs. Britain was home to a broad host of them in the Triassic, ranging from small, modest theropods to the much larger prosauropods, the ancestors of the long-necked titans of the Jurassic. The United Kingdom's oldest meat-eating dinosaur was Pendrag, a small coelophysoid theropod discovered in October 2021. Estimated to grow to around just one meter long, this slender little biped would have been quite the terror to the little lizards and insects that hid in the undergrowth of the forests of Triassic Wales. This little predator was overshadowed for a long time by the larger dinosaurs that inhabited the British Isles throughout the late Triassic, however. Darting in and out of the feet of relative giants, Pendrag would surely have been dwarfed by Acillosaurus, Pantidraco, and Thecodontosaurus, three bipedal sauropodomorphs known to this area. These creatures, which clearly resembled classic images of what we recognize as dinosaurs, were the ancestors of some of the biggest terrestrial animals to ever walk the earth, the sauropods. Giants such as Argentinosaurus, Dreadnoughtus, and Diplodocus can all trace their family trees back to the sauropodomorphs of the late Triassic, and the UK was no stranger to them. These creatures would have been dwarfed themselves, however, by the mighty Camelotia, still a sauropodomorph itself, but one which much more closely resembled its descendants at between 10 to 11 meters in length. Towering above all the other creatures in its domain, this dinosaur may have traveled the land in large herds in search of foliage to browse on. Little Pendrag needn't have worried. Later, it and its other British theropod contemporaries would give rise to much larger meat eaters in the forthcoming Jurassic period. The Jurassic marks the time when things really kicked off, not only for the dinosaurs, but also the reptilian brethren sharing the British Isles with them. The Jurassic saw the advent of the great sauropods, as well as equally great theropods to match them in deadly games of life and death. Strange reptiles ruled the seas and skies, while our mammalian cousins began to find a foothold in the shadows of the dinosaurs. The climate of the Jurassic was warmer than that of present day, averaging between 12 and 29 degrees Celsius in the British Isles. As a result, the land was lush with deciduous woodland, teeming with life. The majority of what would one day become the United Kingdom was submerged by a shallow sea. The tranquility occasionally interrupted by the eerie shadows of large marine reptiles drifting across the waves. The most famous of these marine reptiles is without a doubt Ichthyosaurus, the three meter long dolphin-like fish lizard that would have preyed upon the cephalopods and fish that teemed in the coastal and open waters surrounding Jurassic Britain. Ichthyosaurus was part of a larger order, Ichthyosauria, which contained several amazing creatures, which can also lay claim to these waters across the Jurassic period. The relatively bite-sized Ophthalmosaurus and the titanic Temnodontosaurus are both native to the British Isles, broadcasting the extreme diversity between these species. The seas of Jurassic Britain teemed with life across the entirety of this period, with plesiosaurs diversifying into all new forms, such as the Cryptoclitus and Romaliosaurus as well as the gigantic Pliosaur, Liplurodon, and Pliosaurus towards the end of the Jurassic. The British crocodilians continued to diversify too, into some of the strangest forms known to science. Tyrannoneustis, 
who was a huge ocean-going crocodile, dwarfing modern-day man at five meters in length. In life, this long-snouted, paddle-tailed leviathan would have resembled something halfway between a shark and a modern crocodile, as it sailed through the open ocean on flipper-like limbs. Equally strange, in the Jurassic waters off the British Isles, were the fish. One fish in particular, to be precise, Leedsichthus, the biggest fish to ever live. This titanic filter feeder, at least 16 meters in length, would have drifted across the oceans in schools, mouth agape as they combed the ocean for food. Truly, they would have been the whales of their day. A lead sickness that had fallen victim to an attack from a pliosaur would likely have supported whole ecosystems of creatures, aside from the animal that killed it. From the pterosaurs flying above, picking at the corpse like modern gulls, to the deep dwellers and microscopic organisms that lay in wait for the fish to sink to the bottom of the ocean. High above the waves, the aforementioned pterosaurs were making major headway in their evolution. The Jurassic British pterosaur stock included celebrities such as Pterodactylus, Ramphorhynchus, and Dimorphodon, as well as the newly described Dirk an unusually large Scottish Ramphorin kind pterosaur that would likely have picked fish off the coastal waves on the wing, perhaps nesting on the cliffside like modern gannets and fulmers of today's Britain. As for the dinosaurs, Britain presented them with the perfect conditions to blossom and diversify throughout the Jurassic period. Evolution was left to its own devices on these islands, as the great reptiles spread out into huge new shapes and forms in every corner of the family tree. The Jurassic was like a bountiful summer to the British theropods, and a prime example can be found in the mighty Megalosaurus, the very first dinosaur ever to be named and discovered. Once portrayed as a lumbering crocodile-like animal, modern science has caught up with this six-meter apex predator to reveal it as a powerfully built biped which may have stalked the land in large groups in search of big game to bring down as prey. Eustreptospondylus was a second species of megalosaur, which existed in the Jurassic. At the time of its existence, Britain was composed of scattered islands, separated by shallow seas and coastal estuaries. Eustreptospondylus may have combed the vast beach in search of carrion or live prey items against a spectacular backdrop of crashing waves under a sky screaming with pterosaurs. Britain's Jurassic theropod stock was broadened with Sarcosaurus, which lived towards the early end of the period. At three and a half meters in length, this carnivore would have been one of the first truly large predatory dinosaurs in comparison to the humble beginnings of the Triassic. Some of those humble beginnings could also have been found in the Proceratosaurus, a relatively small Coelurosaur that may have inhabited the densely wooded forests in the middle of these peculiar islands. Ornithischian dinosaurs were now well established in Britain at this time. Groups such as the Stegosaurus and Ornithopods were making headway with the likes of Lexovisaurus, a relative of the famed Stegosaurus with long, sharp shoulder spines. Or Camptosaurus, a large herbivorous ornithopod that may have sustained some of the United Kingdom's larger carnivores. Alongside these spectacular animals, the sauropods were evolving too, famously branching out into truly colossal forms throughout the world during the Jurassic. Britain's claim to this fame can be found through Cetiosaurus, a 16-meter long-necked behemoth that would have been almost invulnerable to predation as an adult. These huge dinosaurs may have lived and survived together in family herds, marching across the floodplains and woodlands, browsing on a mix of vegetation types. The Cretaceous period, lasting from 145 to 66 million years ago, infamously marks the catastrophic end of the Age of Dinosaurs, 
but that didn't stop them from spreading out into many bizarre shapes and forms before the KPG mass extinction took place. Before we get into the dinosaurs that roamed the British Isles throughout the Cretaceous, however, let's take a final look at the other Mesozoic creatures that shared the world with them. Pterosaurs, by the Cretaceous, had begun to evolve in truly extreme forms, some of them fantastic analogs to some of today's species of large seabirds, such as the albatrosses. Ornithochirus was one such pterosaur, discovered in England in the 19th century. With a wingspan measuring 4 to 6 meters in width, these masters of the skies may have migrated across the northern hemisphere as possible remains have also been discovered in Morocco. With its powerful tooth-filled beak, it would most likely have picked up fish and squid on the wing from the sea, similar to modern seabirds. Far below those waves, the famous British ichthyosaurs were continuing to change too. Pervushovasaurus was a large shark-like ichthyosaur, remarkable due to its long, deep snout which may have given off an uncanny appearance, similar to some of today's toothed whales. On the banks of these seas would have lived huge colonies of Enantiornis, a long-necked penguin-like flightless Hesperornithine seabird that, using its stubby wings, reminiscent of paddles, would have swiftly pursued fast-moving fish, snapping them up in a long, toothed beak before returning to the nesting communities on the shoreline. Amphibians continued to evolve throughout the Cretaceous, but in a much more modest manner than the giants of the Carboniferous and Permian periods. Wester Peton is a tiny salamander-like creature, known from the Isle of Wight, which would have lived in the ponds and puddles that covered the land, or perhaps even within the sodden, boggy footsteps of giant dinosaurs. As for the dinosaurs, evolution had run wild towards the end of the Mesozoic. Huge and bizarre new forms had branched out from the survivors of the Jurassic and had spread across the British Isles like wildfire. Europe at the time was still an archipelago of scattered islands, but the outline of Britain was clearly beginning to form. The climate was warm, and shallow seas and lakes were present throughout the land. One creature to famously exploit this watery world was Baryonyx, a species of Spinosaur with long, hooked claws and a paddle-like tail that would have been used to push it through both coastal and fresh bodies of water in pursuit of fish. Long legs and a long snout may have also aided this dinosaur in wading like a reptilian, 10-meter-long egret. Perhaps even more egret-like, was the newly described Spinosaurus cousin of Baryonyx, Riperovenator. No evidence currently points to this dinosaur leading an aquatic lifestyle, and may have instead patrolled the riverbanks and marshes of Cretaceous Britain. Other large theropods include Altispinax, a giant predator with a strange sailed back, Neovanador, a seven meter long Carcrodontosaurian, and Eotyrannus, the United Kingdom's very own cousin to Tyrannosaurus. Little theropods existed here throughout the Cretaceous too. Aristosuchus and Yaverlandia were small, agile hunters, sharing many characteristics with modern birds. These speedy carnivores may have hunted at the treeline or within the forest of the island's interiors. The ornithopods, meanwhile, spread their proverbial wings into creatures of all shapes and sizes. From the armored tank Polocanthus to the bipedal Hypsilophodon, the herbivore stock had adapted to fill ecological niches of all kinds. One Cretaceous ornithopod, however, may just go down in history as the most famous British dinosaur to date, the iconic Iguanodon. Measuring around 10 meters in length when fully grown, these titanic herbivores would likely have roamed the isles in great herds, defending themselves and their young from some of the aforementioned theropods with their infamous thumb spikes, deadly modified digits on their hands that were likely used to jab into the attacker's flank 
or neck to ward off an assault. However, all good things must come to an end. 66 million years ago, a catastrophic extinction event wiped out three quarters of all animal and plant life on Earth. It is still open to scientific debate on exactly what caused such a sheer level of dying at the end of the Cretaceous. But several running theories include a cataclysmic asteroid impact, a series of volcanic eruptions, or climate change, or maybe even a mixture of several causes. With the non-avian dinosaurs gone, the British Isles were free game for the survivors to take control. Mammals, birds and crocodiles proved the most successful in epochs that followed, laying down the foundations which shaped the vibrancy and splendor of the natural world we know today. After the KPG extinction, the Paleocene, Eocene, and Oligocene epochs followed. A time frame spanning from 66 million years ago to around 23 million years ago altogether, in what is collectively known as the Paleogene. Many species of bizarre animals took hold in place of the dinosaurs throughout the Paleogene, beginning once again in small, humble forms. One such creature which thrived in the cool but still temperate climates of the new British Isles is Diacodexus, a small, deer-like hoof mammal with a long tail. It is, in fact, the oldest known member of the Artiodactyl family the large group which contains the modern-day antelopes, sheep, pigs, and deer. It would have found the lush Eocene forests of the UK a paradise, full of rich vegetation. Odd-toed undulates, or parasodactyls, existed in Eocene Britain too. The little horse-like Paleotherium would have shared the forests with Diacodexus, living in the shadow of new and dangerous predators. Avian dinosaurs lived on in the giant bird Gastornis, native to much of Eocene Europe. Scientists are still in debate on the topic of whether or not this flightless, two-meter-tall, cassowary-like bird was a carnivore or a frugivore, or whether it favored one, supplementing its diet with the other. Either way, it would have been an imposing presence among the swaying trees and dense foliage of Eocene Britain for the little herbivores it shared the land with. We now come to our final stop on this amazing tour of natural history. The Neogene and Quaternary periods, lasting all together from around 23 million years ago to around 11,700 years ago, composed of the Miocene, Pliocene, and Pleistocene epochs. We will be focusing heavily on the Pleistocene as this is where the bulk of our knowledge comes from about the great creatures that roamed the British Isles towards the end of the Cenozoic. By the Pleistocene, many animals that you and I would be familiar with today had established themselves in the world, only not where you would expect to find them. Britain was a land populated by mammoths, woolly rhinoceroses, and hippopotamuses, as well as giant deer, lions, hyenas, and bears. Mammothus, the iconic mammoth familiar to us all, roamed the tundra and plains throughout the Ice Age Pleistocene, perhaps bumping into solitary Coelodonta individuals along their way. These woolly rhinoceroses were alive on Earth up until only 14,000 years ago. A tiny step in the colossal geological timescale of planet Earth. The mammoths weren't the only proboscideans in ancient Britain, however. Paleoloxodon, otherwise known as the straight-tusked elephant, also found its way over to the British Isles in the Pleistocene, which would have made for an intimidating sight on the summer plains of Europe, as much smaller hoofed animals grazed in herds alongside it. Cave bears would have been a spectacular encounter, out in the densely wooded lowlands of the British Isles, dwarfing their brown bear contemporaries as active hunters, cave lions, and hyenas prowled through the woods nearby, 
bringing down big game prey such as the Megaloceros, a giant deer with antlers spanning 12 feet in length. Accompanying all of these megafaunal masterpieces of nature was none other than Homo sapiens, us. Modern humans are estimated to have appeared in the British Isles around 40,000 years ago, based on a jaw fragment unearthed in Devon. Humans arrived in this land equipped with the earliest of technologies, the ability to use tools, construct temporary settlements, light fires, and hunt with weapons. Sapiens, unlike anything seen in nature before, had arrived in Britain. We weren't the only human species on the block, however. Neanderthals, or Homo neanderthalensis, was present during the Pleistocene too. Far from the knuckle-dragging primitive stereotypes portrayed by popular media, Neanderthals were in fact sensitive, intelligent individuals, capable of tool use in order to manipulate their surrounding environments to better suit them. These wise creatures, like most of the prehistoric fauna of the Pleistocene, only went extinct relatively recently. In geological terms, we only just missed out on living in a planet with two sapient species of human. So there we have it, a brief natural history of the British Isles. It is staggering to think that the very first complex life forms to appear in our waters millions and millions of years ago have led to where we are now. These cold, rugged islands have seen all manner of life come and go since. From the very first fish and invertebrates, to the hawk-sized dragonflies of the Carboniferous. From the tiny footsteps of a little pendrag, all those eons ago, to the booming cries of Iguanodon, echoing out across the coastlines millions of years later. From the infamous KPG extinction, to the very first humans setting foot on British soil. They had no idea of the wondrous and dramatic natural history of the land laid out before them. What must they have thought? Even today, we continue to dig up new organisms from times long past allowing us to add little pieces of this gargantuan puzzle here and there. Who knows what kind of spectacular and outlandish creatures could be buried in the rolling hills of Yorkshire, the rocky coastlines of Scotland, or the great city of London, while you have been watching this video. Hopefully we won't have to wait too long to find out. 